problems that we face in society, particularly today focusing on the problems that we have of helping children with common mental health problems access help that works when they first need it to prevent you know, lifelong uh, problems in many cases. Okay, so, as David said, you know, anxiety disorders are extremely common. And so when we're talking about anxiety disorders, what we mean here is a level of anxiety or fear or worry that interferes in people's day-to-day -day lives. So um, this can be through the amount of distress it causes, through the avoidance that it may cause of things that may, may otherwise um, enable people to live fulfilling lives. And actually, anxiety disorders are extremely common. So over a quarter of people will meet the diagnostic criteria for an anxiety disorder at some point in their life. So if we wanted to be able to offer a similar service for children and young people with common mental health difficulties, then what should those low intensity treatments look like? What do we need to offer people in order to be able to help people get better quickly uh, with uh, using our resources very efficiently. And so here, psychological theories can help us a lot because they can help us to identify what the mechanisms are that we can focus on so that we can be really targeted and efficient in our approach. And so this is a model of pathways to child anxiety disorders that I worked on some time ago with my colleagues Lynn Murray and Peter Cooper. And this model really aimed to um, pick out the fact that children whose parents have anxiety disorders are more likely themselves to have anxiety disorders, but child anxiety disorders can, of course, also occur in the absence of parental anxiety. And here we were comparing the guided parent-delivered CBT to a treatment called solution-focused brief therapy, uh, because that was the treatment that was often used in these services, because it is something that can be delivered in a setting where you're only able to offer a small number of sessions. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But essentially, Everybody had the treatment, then had a follow-up assessment, and they were followed up again about six months later. And critically, we wanted to include a full economic uh, assessment, health economic assessment, because it's really important to us for these low-intensity treatments to be looking at the cost-effectiveness of these kind of approaches. So the comparison treatment here was brief solution-focused therapy. As I said, that was the one treatment that all of the therapists in those services had received training in. And really, there were two really core principles in this treatment. The one is that, well, no, nobody's perfect. And the good thing is that that applies to our problems as well as everything else. So if we can find exceptions to our problems, that can help us to find potential solutions we can use in other situations. Thanks. Well, obviously, one of the things that we saw is if we're going to have this kind of more efficient system, uh, we need to understand who's going to need to be stepped up. And we want to predict that so that we can we don't offer treatments that are not going to be effective to people. Um, if we know that, you know, we, we get people straight into treatments that are going to work. So who doesn't benefit from these treatments? And a lot of people um, have a lot of assumptions about what it might be. And so these are probably the most common things that people say to us. Well, you know, obviously, the more severe people are going to need more intensive treatment. Older children um, within this pre-adolescent pre group are going to be need to see by a therapist. Other problems, other comorbid problems are likely to get in the way. And it's not going to work if the parent is anxious too. So what have we found about these things? Well, the first thing is that when we look at predictors of outcome, in sort of a lot of those things that we mentioned there, anxiety, symptom, severity, comorbid behaviour problems, but also particular types of anxiety disorders, none of them predicted outcome. Not. So what this might suggest is that, well, if parents are responding to their child's fear or anxiety with fear, intrusiveness, negativity, then you can imagine that that is likely to inhibit the child's adaptive learning from exposure to fear-inducing stimuli. Um, and so what we might want to do here is to have adjunctive treatments where parents are also anxious um, to help them to overcome these sorts of natural responses. So this is what we then went on to do, and this is Rachel Hiller. So here what we did is we supplemented the usual approach with an approach where we were helping parents to tolerate their children's negative emotions um, and um, to manage those whilst helping their children to face their fears. And so, first of all, obviously, we wanted to see, well, had we successfully done that through the intervention? And when we look at this tolerating children's negative emotion condition, we did find that there were parents were less anxious uh, from pre to post treatment in the stress when we repeated a stress task.